<clears throat> Hello, friends. Welcome to TFC Tennis Talk. My name is Ruth, and I'm with the Foot Collective. And our goal at TFC Tennis is to spread the word to our tennis communities that there are alternatives um, to the standard operating procedures um, when it comes to injury prevention, pain management, and overall longevity of our health while we're playing the sport that we love, which is tennis. And I'm here with Tim Brennan today. And Tim Brennan is the inventor of the Vivo Barefoot Soul technology. <clears throat> and he's also a tennis player. And we're super excited to have him here to talk with us today because tennis was actually the catalyst for him engineering the design for the Vivo Barefoot Soul. And so um, I don't wanna waste any time jumping right into our questions and our discussion, but just um, thank you for being here. If you're listening, we really appreciate you taking the time and the interest in what we're talking about. And we look forward to a great discussion. So um, maybe a good place to start, Tim, would be just to introduce yourself and um, maybe tell us a little bit about your tennis history. Like what, how did you get involved in the sport? <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, um, you know, what you love, like, why do you love tennis? And if you're still playing, and if so, like, what's, what's your tennis life like right now? Right. Um, so thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, as soon as I saw the rackets in the background, I knew I was in the right place because like since I was, I don't know, whatever age, like 10 or something, I've been pretty much like obsessed with how do I get better at tennis, 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 tennis. Oh, I have to go to school, right, now back to the tennis. And um, so, yeah, I, I first got involved in tennis, I guess, um, because, well, there were a couple of things. Um, when I was maybe six um, years old, I was at a pretty small school. So the entire school, which um, spanned maybe six, six years of, of, of um, schooling, that entire school was about 70 children. So um, what would happen would be that I, I wasn't really good enough to, to join in with the, with the soccer, the football. So there were about three or four of us. We just weren't good enough to join in. So we were just be left on the sidelines with the ball to practice. And when we were good enough, we were told we'd be able to join in with the rest of the kids. And so um, what ended up happening is because, you know, football was the thing everyone played every lunchtime, because the, the teacher had kind of had said, you're not good enough to join in yet, then that's what used to happen every lunchtime. So I, I, I had this kind of background of not being good enough to, to, to join in in the sports. Um, and, and so what, what I think that sort of set up is like a need to sort of be included at, at some level in the, during a sport. And um, a few years later, I had a best friend. Um, his name was Daniel Bell and he's now a PT teacher. And he, he was really into every sport, but especially tennis. And uh, because I was with him all the time and he wanted to play tennis, he, you know, kind of forced me to get better at tennis, at least to be able to have a rally. And so that's where, where I started. And over many years, I got to the point where I was as good as him. And we both had, you know, poor technique because we kind of just taught ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. But we, we could have kind of like, like every once in a while, we'd hit a great shot. And we'd be happy with that. And then we go back to not being able to sustain a rally for more than a couple of shots. And so, um, yeah, so, so that, that's, um, you know, kind of like a big part of, of why tennis was important to me. Um, but then I think as time went on, I wanted to be better. I just wanted to improve. And I was getting coaching at the local club. Um, and it wasn't bad coaching. It was just kind of like the way, the way that coaching is in the UK is that there's, you know, there, there's just something missing. It's just like, it's not quite at that level that I needed to be at, or it wasn't right for me in some way. So I was, I was pretty down, you know, not, not knowing if I was gonna ever get better than what I was. And um, I also, I, whilst I was having my racket really strong, I switched rackets and I picked up a, a shoulder injury. And so, I had the shoulder injury. I felt like I wasn't getting any better. 
and maybe I never would. And I was really disappointed. So I just said, I'm quitting tennis. I'm never playing tennis again. So um, my mum decided she was going to take me over to see this new coach that someone told her about. And he lived about eight miles away. And I said, don't, just don't bother. I'm, I'm done. Like, I'm not good enough. I've had coaching. I'm not good enough. But in the end, she persisted and we went over. And he turned out to be one of the best coaches. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he taught people um, up to Davis Cup level, but right down to the very beginner level. Like he could do, there was no problem with anywhere in between. He could, he could help someone if they were interested in learning. So, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the things that um, I spent about 10 years learning tennis from him. His name was David Kemp. And um, he, he'd um, previously been the head of tennis at Millfield School, which is the, the very best sports school in the UK. And after that, he left and worked for the, the Lawn Tennis Association, which is the governing body for tennis in the UK. And then he, after that, he, was, he had his private practice at his home, which is when I met him. So he was, he was kind of like um, in his 60s, uh, when I met him, and um, but could still beat me quite easily. So yeah, he was he was a, he was a great great coach and and a really good friend. Um, and I think you know the the confidence that I built up by the things that he taught me, I've been able to you know I I really kind of helped me to think about tennis in a new way. Like no problem was was too big to be solved. And I brought that into, you know, the, the prototyping of Vivo and the way that I got that into, um, you know, the, the hands of the, the Clarks family and then did a deal with them. So I feel like, you know, it's, it wasn't just tennis, the tennis injury that I was getting. It was also the whole philosophy that David brought to me and the way that, you know, I, it kind of, you know, it helped my school. You know, I passed my driving test first time. Like so, the, the tennis coaching it just was like I felt like I was in control of you know my life, which is mm -hmm. it was it was great. Especially you know being at that age, you know, the teenage years can be pretty challenging sometimes. Yeah. Why do you think tennis is so special in that way? I mean, I would definitely want to hear more about like your ankle injuries too, and then like how that that was the catalyst to you. You know looking at the foot and how it um, interacts with ground reaction forces. But like, before we get into that, like the, the emotions of tennis, the problem solving skills, like, why do you think, do you, cause I think that we could probably take any sport or any activity and get some of those life skills that, that I mean, yeah, at 55 years old, I feel like for once I'm getting like truly like life skills when I go play a match, you know? So what do you think it, it is about tennis more so than like other sports or other activities that, that give us that? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, tennis is highly um, psychological. So I, uh, I guess the, the, probably the way I, I, I'm not, you know, um, you know, an expert, but I, it seems to me that the way that the points are set up, like you, you play a point and it lasts for, you know, 30 seconds maybe, and then you have a full like minute, like the, all the time going to picking up the balls, that's time when you can, you know, very much kind of upset yourself about what just happened, because, you know, I think even if you win a match, you only win three out of five points. So there's going to be quite a lot of the time when you've, you've messed something up. And the way that you talk to yourself and the psychology, it, it's, it's almost like the game is set up to really challenge you psychologically. Mm -hmm. um, and my coach, David, he actually invented a game which was a quick fire version of tennis. And the interesting thing was all of the kind of the mental kind of psychological um, problems, the barrier to tennis, were taken away because there was no there was no wasting time between points so there was just like a continual play and i guess if you look at a game like basketball there's there's very little time spent um ruminating about the shot yeah. you just made. 
So I, th I feel like tennis is unique um, in that it's, it's very, you're, you're on your own as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you have to go out there and there might be people watching and, you know, your mistakes are just your mistakes. There's no one else in the team, if you're playing singles at least. So, yeah, I would probably put it down to that. Yeah, that is a very good point. I just, I just realized, like, just how much, why do I keep going back? Because it's equal parts love and fierce hatred. <laughs> You know, and like just I think it is just like you learn so much about yourself so fast and how to problem solve and how to handle situations and you either decide if you're going to do that or if you're just going to be a schmuck about it, you know, so. Yeah, um, yeah so I guess, like, I guess if you've had some, you know, uh, difficult times in your life, then I think you instinctively know that when you play tennis, you're being presented with a similar situation again and again and again and so you you I guess you might be drawn to the sport because you realize that well if I want to master this this is a pretty good sport to go for isn't it yeah it is because it is opportunity after opportunity whether you're playing singles or doubles to just master your insides I really mm -hmm. I really love it for that those reasons um so let's talk about your your injury and then just like the journey to the vivo barefoot soul because I think this is I think this is so brilliant and Nick St. Louis in one of our talks he waited till like the very end to tell me about you and like your relationship to tennis and who you were and I was like oh my god this is crazy so that's why I pestered you <laughs> for a long time and you you rolled your ankle quite a bit and that yeah. and and there was some postural training with the Alexander technique and all the forces collided in the perfect storm for you to sort of set forth the gold standard in, in natural footwear. Yeah. From what, near as I can tell. Yeah. So this was, I guess, once I started working with David, I mean, maybe it was, it was going on probably before that as well, but I had, I had an ankle injury issue that, that kept coming up. And so maybe, I don't know, a dozen times each ankle, I would, I would twist it, I'd roll over my ankle on the tennis court. And um, I, I was wearing a, a really good tennis shoe. It wasn't, you know, um, you know poor quality shoe. Um, it, was, it, was, it was one of the best performing shoes for injuries, but um, I still got this ankle problem. And yeah, I mean, it's, it, it was a very difficult um, thing to deal with. It's, it's, it's a painful injury, but you, after you've done this a few times, you realize it's not an injury that you, you can be back after a few days or, or you know, a short period of time. It's, it's several weeks of not playing. And you know, all of your plans for training, league matches, tournament matches, well, that's all out the window because you're going to be doing nothing for the next month or maybe more. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I I wound up um, at the University of Bath, um, and we I trained it with the tennis team twice a week, starting at eight a.m. before. So we, we had an hour's training before the lecture started at nine fifteen, and I um, I was having Alexander technique lessons for a neck problem that I had, and the the Alexander teacher, her name was Colette Lyons. She showed me her shoes, and she was wearing these trainers, which were very unusual, and she showed me how flexible they were. They, they weren't barefoot or minimalist because that wasn't the thing at the time, but she was wearing um, a, split shot, a split sole shoe, and she called them jazz shoes. And oh, I know those shoes. Yeah, so this, this is what um, dancers will wear um, to get more flexibility. And it's, it's basically very similar to conventional trainer except the sole is in two parts and the middle bit is kind of missing mm -hmm. and so she was telling me about how the foot needs to flex and you know the kind of I guess one of the barefoot principles um, was being represented in that shoe and she she introduced me to the idea of you know what what a shoe needs to do in order to allow the foot to work and then I said okay well what about my ankles and can I extrapolate that and you know, expand on that whole you know, idea of like more room for the toes, more sensory feedback, no heel, um, 
and keeping that flexibility and making the heel um, so that it doesn't interfere with the way that the heel rolls um, and just you know keep going with that and maybe it can help me with my ankle so yeah that the, the easiest thing for me to do rather than making a shoe I just took my shoes off so I arrived instead of arriving at eight I arrived at 7 30 to the tennis courts and I was running around doing my footwork exercises and just kind of like teaching my body like you know, this is what it feels like to to do your footwork without a shoe and I, I think now even now that's a really valuable exercise it's better it's the, one of the best educational things you can do to get even if you don't want to wear a minimalist shoe or if you do want to wear a minimalist shoe you can remind your body of what it's like to to, to move without a shoe mm -hmm. so that's what I did I, I did sort of some sprinting some crisscross step and some side steps and I just kind of played around with the idea and I got the feeling that I there was no way I was going to twist my ankle with, yeah. without a shoe so I was thinking it's the shoe it's the shoe that's the, the, the factor that I need to change and so that, that was kind of like the, the, the starting point. I knew I had something at least, at least for my injury and maybe it was good for other people as well. Did you have other, did you have up the chain, like up your body, like knee pain, low back pain or anything um, as a result of having so many ankle injuries? Um, so I, I believe, you know, the body is connected and um, I always had a, Problem when I was growing up with my um, my toes turning inwards, and uh, my dad being a trainee Alexander teacher, he um, I was maybe twelve or something, and he took me and and you know we I was a guinea pig in his in his training course, and he also took me to some experienced Alexander teachers about how I can um, you know correct that inward turn, and so me I mean I'm not sure if I was trying to alleviate something with you know by turning that the toes in or maybe that set the ankles up for injury I, I don't know but um yeah that that that's definitely one of the first things that comes to mind um I guess if you if you looked at me even today I mean probably more in those days when I was a teenager I think the way that um school um gets you to to write at a desk the the that shape of the spine, I think is common throughout the whole Western world. Um, we kind of like carry that shape through everything that we do. So when I'm, you know, playing tennis, I guess I'm, you know, I'm compromising my spine and my shoulders in my game. I'm, I'm more aware of it these days, so it probably is less, less um, obvious, but I, that's probably, you know, part of the, that injury as well. I feel like if you want to, help you if you've got an injury in your foot it might be something to your shoulder or your back or something else what um how often are you playing now and what are you wearing um what are you wearing on your feet and do you still train beforehand barefoot or do you do some um, footwork barefoot so this is the thing so barefoot training is the reason why i arrived um half an hour early to the training because i knew there'd be no one there and I guess like drawing attention to myself is not something I love doing, um, <laughs> but more so I feel like, you know, tennis clubs in particular, they're, they're quite yeah, picky about, you know, rules and there's an etiquette and dress code. And, you know, I'm not at a club where we have to wear whites or a collar or any of that, but to, t to turn up on a court and not have shoes on, I feel like that would be kind of asking for trouble. <laughs> so, I, I tend to do that I guess um, in my garden um, you know I've got like a concrete path so I could you know if I've got if I've got something to go and fetch I'll do that without shoes and I'll just you know do that in a small way sometimes at home but yeah um, what I will wear on my feet um, I wear Vivo Barefoot um, Primus Lights um i i've got quite a specific need in my shoes so there's even 
um, within minimalist shoes. There's only very a very small amount of minimalist shoes that I'll get along with, and it, you know I I like you know some some minimalist shoes I I really like the look of, but if I do too much in them, then I start to get some of my old you know ankle pain back. So yeah, so I I need to kind of kind of um, make sure that it's the very thinnest sole, mm -hmm. and I pay very specific attention to how supple the heel is because i i mean i might have poor technique but i found that the way that when i when i lunge in tennis i'm landing a lot of the time heel first and i feel like that's that's kind of i can manage that as long as the the heel is not too um stiff so what you find is um some shoes even if they're minimalist, the, the, the heel has been, it's, it's too thick or it's too stiff, the, the material is not quite right. So you, can, you can't really push your thumbs in. And mm -hmm. that, kind of, that can change sometimes over time, you can break the shoe in. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like if, I, if I'm in the, the shop and I'm massaging that heel, if I can feel that there's a little bit of give, then I'm probably okay. But if, if it's too stiff, then I think it's, I'm probably gonna get an injury before I break the shoe in if it gets broken in at all. So I found the, the Primus Light is, is one of the, the best shoes for that. Because um, you're saying like it kind of keeps you honest because the heel is soft enough so that if you're landing on your heel, um, it's feedback to not do that. Is that what you're saying kind of? I, I think that I, I don't have the, you know, the proof, but my interpretation <laughs> of the situation is that if, if you've got a hard, rigid um, shell on the heel, then the, the foot is not going to roll in, in the sort of natural way because the, the bone of the foot is rounded. And I believe that the, way, the reason why it's rounded is because when, I, I know this is kind of controversial because some people think that when you walk, you should be landing midfoot. And maybe, maybe that's true, I'm not sure. But I, I've seen when, Children learn to walk, they'll, they'll land heel first and then roll onto the midfoot and then toe off. So I feel like there's, there's something about, if you've got like a, a new um, rigid surface, which is not the heel, but the, the heel bone, but is actually this heel of the shoe, I feel like it's changing the mechanics of the foot in a way which you need more muscle tension in the foot in order to control the roll as the, as the foot flattens out onto the ground, I think it needs more tension to control that. Yep. So it, it might be because my, my ankles have got a history of injury, but I pick up on that extremely quickly. And if I were to go for a long walk in, within an hour, my, my ankles probably would be hurting. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's, that's kind of important for me. Oh, interesting. So you seem like a passionate tennis player and it seems like you follow, I, I saw something on your Instagram page where you had in slow motion, um, one of Alcaraz when he twisted his ankle um, in one of his matches. And I, and my I guess my next question is like, with the progression of the natural footwear industry and like what we, what we know about how important foot health is for the for the entire body you said something so relevant i think like when you're barefoot on, when you're on the tennis court barefoot you you in, intuitively know that you're not going to twist your ankle mm -hmm. and i i didn't realize that that is true like i feel so secure in a well barefoot yes but like you were saying like you can't you can't not get kicked out of the club if you're going to be barefoot. So you have to have some covering on there. But mm -hmm. when I'm in like the, the most um, natural shoe possible that's closest to my foot, I feel so confident that I am not going to hurt myself. Yeah. And so my question is, do you think that the athletes at the highest level, like the, especially like um, my partner in this project, Nick Holt wanted me to ask you like with the modern tennis game, with all the sliding on the hard courts, with the impact forces, do you think that those athletes at that highest level can compete if they were trained properly at the same level in a pair of natural footwear or a minimalist shoe? <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. And, um, 
I guess um, I like to think that they can, but whether I'm whether they can or not, I think it it's one of those unknown questions, and it's I feel like it's a bit similar to in you know, like in in the world of tennis before the seven, 1970s, it was said that no one would, would ever win Wimbledon uh, with two hands on the backhand, and um, and these days you know it's it's normal, and you know there was there was a lot of at the time, it was evident that that, that hadn't happened and um, people were, um, you know, pointing to the science and, you know, why that would never be the case. But um, then came along Connors and proved, proved everyone wrong and, and, and Chris Ever as well. So, um, you know, I, I don't know the answer to the question, but I can definitely think of the factors that have to be overcome because I get yeah, the, the ankle injury um, is a big is a big deal. Um, a lot of people won't know of how many ankle injuries happen in the professional game, but they're very common. And um, I mean, I, I know that Andy Murray had ankle problems early in his career, and he's for pretty much his entire career has worn ankle braces, and that seems to be like the the solution. That I mean, if you can win a Grand Slam wearing ankle braces. Then you know that 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 solution seems to be the, the best thing, okay? Um, because you get to still have the, the cushioning, and the cushioning is a double-edged sword. I, I don't. I, I can tell you all the problems with cushioning that you can't feel the impact with the ground, that it changes the way that you run, and it can lead to sort of long-term um, impact injuries in in, in your um, hips and knees and ankles and maybe your back and you know. So, but at the same time, from playing, I know that I can stop quicker um, with padding. Um, so, if you're if you're looking for the best performance, then that's something which you have to at least learn how to play slightly differently. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, that's the that's the the very most um, sort of important factor. That if you can get if you can get the kind of recovery time and I'm not a professional athlete, so I haven't tested this to the nth degree, but I think if you can get the if, you know, sideways moving and then getting back to the same point, if you can match the, the recovery time in a, in a minimalist shoe, then I think you've cracked the puzzle. And, and, uh, and you know, um, that's, that's the challenge. And it's, it's really about how do you go from a, like a 100% um, sprint to stopping and then turning back the other way and getting back into position. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, mm, I mean, yeah, I, I like to think that it's possible to be honest with you because um, I feel like your, your sprint is gonna be quicker because there's less, there's less resistance and you can really use the plant of flexion to, because it's, there's no resistance to that, um, to that movement of going up onto the ball of the foot. Um, so I feel like they, you know, if you look at sprinters, they, ru they run in spikes, which are very, very thin. Um, they're, they're basically minimalist shoes. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you think, you know, the sprint time is gonna be quicker. Mm -hmm. And if you can, you know, somehow make the, the, the stopping time short enough, then I think that it's possible. But for someone who's grown up in a, in a full, you know, cushioned tennis shoe, to be able to get used to the minimalist shoe, it's going to take some work, and you're going to have to really believe in it or have some injury that you can't avoid some other way. And I guess the ankle brace is the kind of is the reason why people don't have to get used to something like a minimalist shoe because that's the the easier option. But it seems yeah, like yeah. No, I was just going to say, it seems like the trade-off to like Andy Murray's ankle braces is up the chain, right? Because like when you, when you really immobilize the ankles, I mean, he has so many other issues, right? He has a metal hip. He's got like, he's got like all other kinds of injuries up the chain. That's been my experience is that since I've uh, mitigated the problem at the feet, I, I mean, for all intents and purposes at my age and with my injury history, I shouldn't be playing um, and improving at the level I am. 
you know, like I'm not a, I mean, I'm not a professional athlete, but I am playing with like in 18 and over leagues and competing at a level that I'm very happy with without injury. So I guess the trade-off is, do you want to win a grand slam? And, and we're trying to talk to our whole entire communities and look at the big picture, you know, but like um, from like beginning tennis, recreational tennis players and like, what can, what can those athletes do to not have such devastating injuries? Like um, Zverev's ankle injury with his ligaments and, and then like over the course, even like Rafa Nadal with the injury um, in his foot or his like degenerative um, foot injury and like just the up like all the other subsequent injuries when they start to like really immobilize the feet it seems that there has to be a link to those abdominal injuries because the body has to like compensate in other ways what do you think about that yeah i i think there's a lot to be said about you know the way that tennis i mean tennis is a pretty brutal sport and you you know, there's nothing natural about the way that you move on a tennis court. You're you're running sideways a lot of the time. You're twisting, turning, changing direction. Um, I think that the body has probably evolved to run in in one direction um, in a straight, you know, forwards. Um, but you know, to 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 have to stop and starting is is quite hard on the body. So, I think you know, but. You know, if you can be um, as kind as possible, given the, 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 the sport is hard on the body, be as kind as possible. I think, you know, in my experience, I wouldn't be playing the game now if, I, um, if it wasn't for minimalist shoes. I just, I just wouldn't be able to. Mm-hmm. Um, I couldn't find a solution. And I'm sure that there's, you know, for every Djokovic, Nadal, Federer, Andy Murray, there's there's probably countless other people who had a career-ending injury that might obviously be because of you know um, something to do with their footwear or the way that they're using the body. There's a misuse somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't I don't necessarily believe in you know injuries being um, kind of hereditary. I think it's a combination of your genes and the way you're using your body and the equipment is a big part of that. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, interestingly, because uh, I was talking with Nick St. Louis about Rafa Nadal's um, degenerative bone, supposedly hereditary. And his take on that was that that is a wear and tear injury and you can call it hereditary, but it can be, it could be worked with. And so that kind of brings me to my next question, um, which is if let's just say Rafa Nadal had you're, you had his ear for 10 minutes and he expressed an interest in switching from, well, and this is also, before I say this, like, I'm not trying to like get every athlete to switch to natural footwear, but I do want to spotlight everything that we're talking about, which is that to see the devastating injuries, to look at the tennis communities that I play in, start to um, diminish in numbers because people are constantly in chronic pain, they're injured, they're consistently getting injured. And I look at the shoes getting more and more um, artificially cushioned higher. And we're, we're playing in these shoes and I cannot help but to like try to talk about alternatives to this. And so talking about the elite level athletes is an interesting place to go because it's in those, like you just have one athlete to express an interest, like maybe Djokovic, um, you see him training barefoot sometimes, or, um, you know, there are people who work with balance beams who are getting the benefits of getting to know what foot health means for the rest of the body and our athletic abilities. So I don't want to like make it seem as if I think everybody should switch to natural shoes and compete, but it is worth going to that end of the spectrum to talk about it, to just see like what is available along the whole continuum of tennis, because like you were saying that you get to play with your 60 year old friend, David. Yeah. Who can beat you quite easily. And tennis is a lovely sport in that, like you can play with all sorts of people at any time. And the most unlikely people will beat your ass down. (laughs) And it just is, it's so fun. And so to like, try to keep people healthy to do it longer is my goal. So Back to my question. If you did have Rafael Nadal 
and he wanted he expressed an interest to you in wanting to switch to natural footwear like how would you advise him or what would you tell him to do and um yeah let's just play with that thought experiment for a second yeah so i guess the so the name vivo is it's not just a nice name it's it really is about the, the process that created the products and so um Vivo is a word in, in uh, Latin, which means in a living thing. And I, I very much believe that the way that you um, explore this, this realm of the minimalist or the nat or, or, you know, natural footwear is, is like an internal journey as much as anything. So whilst you can, you can be inspired by other people's stories, and there's obviously some science around it now, but I feel like, you know, um, especially for an athlete, they need to find, it's, it's like a, a journey um, within and it's a journey of unlearning. So, you know, uh, um, and exploring as well. And you have to take your time because, you know, your, your feet uh, are continually adapting to, to you know, the, the shoes that you're wearing, the way that you're moving, the demands that um, are put on them. So, if uh, as soon as you take off your shoes and walk barefoot, the, the surface of the, the bottom of the foot will start to um, have more and more of a layer of padded fat. Um, so fat deposits are put down when um, the sensory feedback um, uh, you know, triggers that process. So it probably takes, I don't know, six months or something like that. It's, a, it's several months of being barefoot or maybe in a minimalist shoe um, for that fat layer to build up. Now that fat layer, I feel is really important in, in tennis because if you, I mean, if I had a break and didn't play for a while, then that fat layer might go away. If, um, then if I came back to the game, um, I haven't got that, um, that layer of fat in my foot and um, a bruising injury could happen. So. It's like the way that you learn to play tennis um, barefoot or in a minimalist shoe is it's trial and error. And you need to kind of, you need to work with the foot and know that it's a moving target. But at the same time, you need to kind of almost make a few mistakes and go, right, I've got a bruising, I've got a bruising injury on my heel. It was because of that shot that I hit, that I hit and it was on break point and I, I overdid it and I landed a little bit too hard. And not to say that you can never do that action again, but right now my foot wasn't ready for that kind of, you know, force. So it's about working with like, um, how can I change my technique? It, it, it's a big undertaking. Um, how can I change my technique, my, strat my game strategy? Maybe instead of, you know, that, that wide ball that normally I can recover from and get him back into position, it's now, um, the case that maybe I'm going to have to go for a winner because I won't, you know, I won't be able to get back into position at the moment. Or maybe I need to work on my recovery so I am back in position. So, you know, it adds it adds a whole new dimension, and it's a, it's a long journey. I mean, I think it probably would take, you know, a few years to master, um, yeah. to master that for someone who. Is, is used to a cushioned sole, I think it's, it's a long-term process. Um, yeah. and it, you know, it's, an, it's, um, it's an exploration. Yeah, that is so true. And to watch the athletes, the way they're accustomed to playing, right? Because of the technology of the shoe that they use, that it, it, it is like unlearning everything that you learned and then rebuilding your strategy, especially for somebody like, Rafa Nadal or Alcaraz, who are so powerful in how they use their bodies um, with yeah. that shoe, you know, like that everything would, everything about who you are would have to change in a certain way, right? Which yeah. I think is true. Uh, I think belief, I mean, you know, we, uh, as much as when you see a professional athlete out on the court and they seem to be standing alone, there's actually a whole belief system that's governing everything that they're doing, okay. um, all the coaching they've ever had, the whole of the community on tour, and you know all the science that goes into all the equipment and the, the movement. It, there's, a, there's thousands and thousands of people who are influencing 
the way things are done um, in one professional athlete you're watching. So the belief that it can be done and this is, you know, um, the, the right way to do it, the best way to do it, um, I think is everything. Um, the, the Probably the, re you know, I can see that money is a big problem at the moment um, in the game because the, the athletes are being sponsored by companies that have got a lot of science behind their latest shoe. And, you know, I, I guess... That, as much as anything, is, you know, that, that kind of belief that, well, the scientists can't be wrong. How can a thousand top experts in, in footwear, how can they all be wrong? Mm -hmm. But, you know, times change and, you know, this is the, this is the way that the history books um, tell the story, that sometimes we are wrong about things. And I think it's, it's an area worth exploring, especially mm -hmm. if, if people are getting injured, like you're experiencing. Yeah. Do you knowing, I mean, just your background and your journey with like the, inventing the soul, which is such a great story, um, which I'm going to put a link in the notes to, so people can hear you talk about how you took off the soul of your K-Swiss. And then when you were riding the double decker bus, you would sew on your, your barefoot soul. I think that is the best story, Tim. Um, but what, just like your whole journey to coming to Vivo Barefoot with all of this technology and Vivo Barefoot, along with, you know, a whole host of other brands now are, you know, kind of, the word is spreading. Do you think that natural footwear industry has a chance? Um, like, do you think that we can, we will be able to eventually compete with the bigger names, Adidas and Nikes and all of this, like, because ultimately it is, I mean, just in talking with Dave O'Hare and like the sponsorships and stuff and all that plays such a big role in, in the celebrity athletes and how they are presenting the products to the world. Um, you know, like uh, Nick and I were talking about getting a, a couple of pairs of <clears throat> Vivo barefoot into the hands of like Dave O'Hare and some of the athletes that they work with and have training sessions with people who know how to, you know, transition gradually and how to work with the athlete to unlearn some of those bad habits and stuff. Do you think that we have a chance to get the word out to like the big, like, is it a pie in the sky idea or do you think we're on the right track and it's possible? Yeah. So, I mean, when you think, when you boil it down, I mean, there's, there's nothing that's stopping us from taking our shoes off and being properly barefoot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's been the case forever. Mm -hmm. So we've been we've been this close to the, the ultimate barefoot condition forever. But what I feel like has changed is now that there is a business model, which, uh, you know, Vivo Barefoot and the other minimalist shoe companies are, are you know, are working with. And, and so they they've got now a marketing budget. So for every pair of shoes that sold, some of that money will go into spreading the word. Um, you know, forwarding the education, forwarding the science, and, and, and making it a bigger sort of belief system in the world so that it's not a crazy thing to take off your shoes mm -hmm. um, or wear a shoe which doesn't have any structure. Um, whereas, you know, when, when um, back in you know, 2002, when I graduated with my prototypes, um, it took about a quarter of an hour introducing the shoe of just telling the person that cushion soles weren't necessarily the best thing for the foot. And I think now we've got to a point where people know that there's another option. They can, they can carry on with the cushion soles if that's working for them, and that's fine. I don't, wouldn't ever want someone to stop using something if it was working for them, but if it's not working for them, then there's now another option. And that's, that's what I, I think is, is, is growing all the time. So. I mean, yeah, I think, you know, you, you have to be very patient with big shifts like this. Um, and some, suddenly, um, like a very small amount of progress will turn into a big sort of avalanche overnight. And it seems like the whole world has changed um, overnight. But it's actually, you know, might take 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. So you get to the point where everyone says, why didn't we think of this sooner? But yeah, I think I think the, it's a growth industry. Um, if I if I walk on um, the London Underground, uh, if I'm on the tube for an hour, I might see a thousand pairs of shoes. 
And it, typically one pair, apart from me, one pair will be Vivo Bertha. And I can spot them from quite a distance away now. Um, but he, for, for a long time, that was, that was never the case. Like I, I would never see anyone. Um, so that's, that's definitely, you know, it's, gr it's growing, it's definitely growing. Um, but, you know, London is supposed to be a forward thinking place and one in a thousand shoes for somewhere that is supposed to be, you know, cutting edge, that's still a drop in the ocean, isn't it? So yeah, yeah there's a long way to go. And um, I, I think um, it's even less when it comes to children's shoes, which is where all of the development happens in terms of our running style and the way that the foot forms. So I feel like it's still very much in the infancy and um, yeah, but a long way to go, but definitely it's going in the right direction at the moment. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much for spending a little time talking with us today. Maybe you'll want to come back and do it again sometime. Absolutely. Anytime. Yeah. Thank you, Ruth. Okay. It's been a privilege to be here. Likewise, likewise. Okay, friends. Well, thanks for tuning in. If you've made it this far, talking about tennis and nerding out, are there are there is there anything in particular you're working on your tennis game right now? Um, yeah, I want to get my first serve in more often. And, uh, <laughs> we were just talking about this last night. <laughs> I lost yeah. so bad last night, Tim. I lost one six. My, I played doubles last night and um, three six, but it was the most, this is one of the things I love about tennis. It was the most satisfying loss because we were playing two players who were, a, you know, a level above us and there were so many good points. And that's another part of the psychological game. Like sometimes I go away from a win and I feel so crappy. And then sometimes I go for, from a go away from like the most biggest beat down and it looks like I should be sad, but I'm elated. And the That's first best. serves, the first serves are key. How are you getting better and how are you doing it? Well, I just want to say that's the best attitude you can have because you know, you'll, you'll get better by wanting to play people who are really good and you know, you'll learn from that. And uh, yeah, so I, I mean, in my club, when when there's a team that is kind of like so much better than us, a lot of people are like, oh, I was just an insult. But I'm like, put me in those matches because I want to see how they're doing things. Yes. And, you know, it's it's like little things like the with the volley, they're, they're not taking a swing really. They're just, they're just really sharp. The reactions are so quick. And I just love like being in the company of someone who's, who's just at that, a level that I don't normally see. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I'm I'm forever replaying. You know, like uh, I, I don't know if you have this, but I've got like a stack of VHS tapes of recordings of Wimbledon from the '90s, and um, I I have also in my mind I've got I've got like the same thing going on that I've got tennis lessons that I replay over and over and over. So as I'm as I'm sort of like placing the ball up to serve, I'm telling myself where I wanted to go, and uh, so I'm doing that all the time. Yeah. Oh my gosh! And um and are you getting your first serves in more? Sometimes I. <gasps> yeah, it's I, I I have I have evenings when I'm like on fire, and um, other times when the second serve has to do its do its work because the first one is not going in, but. I've got a good second serve, so it's not like a total disaster, but not hitting aces on the second serve so much. But um, yeah, so I like, I like the feeling of hitting an ace. Who doesn't? Yeah. I don't really know that yet, but, but I'm looking forward to the day when it happens. <laughs> it's all in the throwing action. Yes. Yeah, it's a good throwing action. Okay. Well, I know that was an extra question thrown in there, but I couldn't help myself. And um, yes, thanks, thanks, friends, for listening, and we'll catch you in the next one. Ciao for now.